All right, thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, so, I uh, many many patients with blood vessel spasm go on to undertake botulinum toxin injections or surgical procedures, uh, but there are some oral medications, pills in, in so many words, that may have some use in, uh, in blood vessel spasm. And I was asked to briefly discuss some of these. Uh, we'll have just a couple of slides of background first. So blood vessel spasm is thought of as a dystonia. So dystonia is sort of a complicated term. Basically, it means involuntary, uh, patterned, that's really the key word, patterned uh, contraction of muscle. Okay. Now, there's all sorts of different types of dystonia. Dystonia may affect the whole body, half the body, or what we call focal dystonia, just a part of the body. And blood first spasm is an example of that, where you have essentially closing of the eyes as the main involuntary dystonia. Some people with blood first spasm may have other facial involvements. We call that cranial dystonia. You may have blood first spasm and neck involvement. We would call that a segmental dystonia. But again, uh, it's, it's really just nomenclature based on the description of the term. And the key is that it's involuntary and patterned, and there's many, many causes of, of dystonias. So real quick, just, just 30 seconds or, or less, uh, I don't need to show this to this crowd probably, but this is some of the involuntary eye blinking. In this case, when she talks or when she sings, it tends to stop, which is typical for blood first spasm in this case, and then she stops, it'll, it'll get going. So this is the, the blood first, you know, classic sort of Beffler spasm that only is involving eyelid closing. Okay, so oral medications for blood first spasm. Well, how do you know whether a medication works for a disease? Uh, so you'd say, well, you just give it to someone and see if it works. But there are problems with that, uh, what we call open label uh, studies. Um, some people just get better on their own. Okay, I mean, something like blood spasm can certainly wax and wane, good months, bad months, that sort of thing. And if you catch them start on a bad month when patients are more likely to come to the doctor because it just finally, it's just so bad, I want to go to the doctor and it got better anyway next month and you take the medicine, you might falsely think that the medicine was, was to, to, was to uh, the result of that. Uh, and then there's also placebo response. Uh, patients want to get better. Uh, and uh, sometimes if you have a treatment, uh, just the placebo or the will to get better will also improve patients. So in medicine, what we like to do to, to, to counteract those things is what's called placebo-controlled trials. And these are trials where patients uh, get either the medicine or a sugar pill, a placebo, and the patient doesn't know what's what, and most importantly, the physician who's given it to them and treating them in the study doesn't know what's what. Okay, and this is thought to be the way, the gold standard to prove that a medicine truly helps with uh, with a, with a disease, with a condition. Now it turns out in blepharospasm there is very, very little in that as far as placebo controlled trials. And most of the things I'll show you are what we call open label trials, where it's basically give the medicine and the patient reports back how much how much improved they are. So we don't have the sort of quality of data that we, in blepharospasm as we have in many, many other conditions, okay? So that being said, with that caveat, uh, let's talk about some of the medicines that tend to be used for blepharospasm, and I'll go by the sort of categories or classes. So anticholinergics, so we'll talk about them. Dopamine agonists are used, dopamine antagonists. So an agonist is something that mimics or stimulates something. An antagonist is something that blocks it. So, you know, right off the bat, that's never made a lot of sense to me where you're doing the opposite things, and both of them have been touted to help blepharospasm. Uh, benzodiazepines, these are the medicines like diazepam and so forth, and then some other muscle relaxants and autonomic meds we'll talk about in a little more detail. So the anticholinergics, um, as we'll see when I'm showing some other slides, these are arguably uh, considered to be the most effective, histor at least historically, uh, medicines for uh, blood first spasm, and, and again, used for dystonia in general. Um, this is a variety of names. Trihexafenadyl in the United States is sort of most traditionally used as an anticholinergic, but these medicines work by blocking the chemical from the nerve to the muscle. Uh, in a way, they work a little bit like botulinum toxin, except unfortunately they do it everywhere in the body and the brain. So they have a number of different side effects as well, mostly sedation. They can sort of, you know, kind of dope you up. But most of the medicines, <laughs> in so many words that we talk about, can kind of dope you up a little bit if you take big enough doses. Uh, anticholinergics especially have dry mouth. In fact, that's almost guaranteed that you'll get some dry mouth on these medications. Constipation, they slow down your gut, okay? So these medicines do have a fair amount of side effects. 
Uh, but, uh, but again, Trioxin, Vendafil, and, and maybe Benzedrapine are probably the two most commonly ones administered in the United States. And these are all old drugs, very, very, these are all 50-year-old drugs at least, okay? Okay, dopamine agonists. Uh, so these are medicines that are sometimes used for things like Parkinson's disease or restless leg syndrome. Um, and uh, they have been touted in various open label studies uh, and uh, not touted in controlled trials to, to improve blepharospasm. Personally, I don't tend to use these very, very often. Uh, but levodopa, for example, is, is becomes dopamine, so that simply becomes the chemical dopamine. Some of these other ones, bromocryptine, lysoride, apromorphine, mimic dopamine, okay? Amantadine is a little bit trickier. It, it has multiple mechanisms, but it prevents the reuptake or, or breakdown of dopamine. And methylphenidate, which is like Ritalin, uh, is also a dopaminergic drug. Again, working in a different way where it prevents the breakdown or reuptake of dopamine. So it increases dopamine on the back door, as opposed to something like levodopa, which simply becomes dopamine. So that's this class of medicines called dopaminergic medicines, okay? And nausea is the most common side effect. With these, they can be sedating, they can lower your blood pressure. Um, they don't tend to cause these wiggly movements in people with dystonia, like they see Michael J. Fox, he's kind of bouncing around. He has Parkinson's disease on these medicines. In that disease, they cause that, but in dystonia, they don't cause those sort of involuntary movements. Next class to talk about a little bit is the dopamine blockers or inhibitors, so almost the opposite. Uh, and these medicines often were developed initially as in psychiatric medications, so for schizophrenia and things like this. So there's two main classes of this. Either they're, they're drugs that block the dopamine receptor. So dopamine has to get from point A to point B. It gets to point B in this receptor, and then this receptor does other things. So the ones that block the receptor basically lodge in that receptor and don't let dopamine do what it's supposed to do. And again, some of the, you know, haloperidol or haldol is a medicine there, that or Thorazine is an even older medicine that people may be familiar with in this class. The second type of medication in this class are ones that prevent the dopamine from being released, okay? And these are called these VMAT2 inhibitors and the tetrabenazine, deuterated tetrabenazine, valbenazine, which are newer medicines, uh, do the, this other uh, mechanism of action. But the bottom line is with all these medications, they reduce the flow of dopamine from point A to point B. Main potential side effects of this, again, these can be very, very sedating medications. Uh, again, sort of dope you up, uh, slow you down a little bit. Uh, weight gain, and then this, this whole thing called extrapyramidal side effects, which can be very, very problematic, because if you block dopamine receptors, one, you can get, you can get too slow. I mean, you're trying to slow down movement with the blood spasm, but your whole body can get too slow, and you can get Parkinsonism, okay, where the, the whole body is just very slow. And then most problematically, you can get this sort of permanent side effect called tardive dyskinesia, where you get these other different involuntary movements. And the reason that's a bit more serious is because it doesn't go away if you stop the medicine, okay? It, it persists potentially for life. So again, these, med uh, these the medicines that block the receptors, like the haloperidol, do have these potential side effects. Uh, and, and we, you know, you have to have a serious problem, I think, to, to use the dopamine blockers for, for a movement disorder because they are potentially a little more problematic. The ones that block the release of dopamine don't have those long-term side effects quite as much. Okay, the next class are what we, you know, I would just call the GABAergic medications, and these are the mostly benzodiazepines. So this is the clonazepam, alprazolam, lorazepam, uh, these sorts of medications that are off that have, were invented predominantly for anxiety and as I had sleeping pills, but they're also muscle relaxant medications. Uh, very little actual data on these medications, but they certainly are used. Uh, they certainly can reduce anxiety. They certainly can help sleep, uh, and for some people, you know, they do actually have pretty good results with, uh, with this class of medicines. Baclofen's a little bit different in how it works, but it's another muscle relaxant uh, medicine that works on this chemical GABA, which is an inhibitory chemical. So that's a, one of the main brain chemicals that seems to put the brain asleep, okay, is this GABA. And these stimulate this GABA. Last one, just sort of as an aside by itself, because it's a little bit newer, and this is a uh, work out of, out of Baylor. So uh, aproclonidine, which is, um, a medicine that in so many words blocks the, some of the effects of adrenaline. 
And what it's thought to do is there are, of course, some, some fairly complicated muscles around the eye that result in blinking and other, and other eye movements. Uh, there's some muscles that respond more to adrenaline, so fight or flight type uh, response. And one of the things is you open your eyes real wide. Okay, that's a, you know, if there's, if you're, something is coming at you, your eyes are going to open like this. And that's thought to be due to certain muscles that respond more involuntarily uh, to adrenaline than voluntarily. Okay, and it turns out there are some, some medicines uh, that actually stimulate those muscles and are thought to maybe open the eye this way. So they're a little bit different. They're not working on preventing the eye from closing, relaxing the muscles, but they're working on actually opening the eyes more with different muscles. So I think it's kind of a unique group uh, with that, and, and hopefully more, more uh, work will come with this, with this uh, medication. Okay, so I'm going to go through just real quickly a bunch of miscellaneous type medicines. And these are all medicines that have undergone small, small studies, okay? So the parentheses number in, in when I was looking through the literature of what's published is the number of patients in these studies. So these are tiny, tiny studies, okay, compared to other things where we have thousands of people that have taken these medications. So methylphenidate is kind of interesting because, again, it's one of the ones that increases dopamine. There are two studies I could find that looked at very immediate benefits. So they, they were looking at patients with blood flow spasm. They took the pill and looked at them again like two hours later, uh, that sort of thing. It showed some interest. And that's, that's kind of interesting because, again, to me, it's a little bit counterintuitive uh, because methylphenidate sometimes worsens other involuntary movements. So I think certainly more work needs to be, uh, needs to be done. Uh, tizanidine, uh, which is another muscle relaxant, didn't, there was an actual prop, sort of a proper study which didn't show any benefit of that medication, uh, but some people still use it. Uh, the ones that I get asked the most about, what about you know, CBD oil, this sort of stuff? Uh, to date, I could find one study in blepher spasm in five patients that felt CBD oil helped a little bit with the, with the blepher spasm. Again, not a proper trial with a placebo or anything like that, uh, but that's all I could find in the literature right now. And then going down the list, really, I think not much else as far as uh, a whole lot of support for other muscle relaxants here. Clozapine is another very specific antipsychotic medicine, uh, some other muscle relaxants. Uh, but again, I think there's almost, these are just like case reports. One person tried it and they got better. So again, not really compelling evidence in, in my mind. All right, so let's look at a couple of the uh, the big studies over the years that have looked at lots of people that have had this, and these are all open label, so there's no placebo in any of these, but these are large series. And some of these you'll see are fairly, are fairly old, okay? Uh, because back in the 80s, we didn't have much of the botulinum toxin and the surgery, so most, uh, really everyone was on medication. So there's actually more people that tried medicines decades ago than, than really try medicines these days. So one large study, okay, 1988, 264 people, and, and some of this wasn't a pure blepharospasm group. They had some other things in, involved with the other conditions that affected eyelid opening in this. But this is a, a, a list of patients that, the percentage of patients here that were felt to have a good response. Now this is, again, it's very unscientific in a way, it's not very carefully elucidated, but the anticholinergics, okay, had, you know, 96 people had tried those, and about one out of five had, were thought to have a really good response with the anticholinergics. Levodopa, one out of five. The dopamine agonists, about one out of five, were thought to have a good response here. And then it sort of goes down a little bit as, as you go on. Tetrabenazine is one of the medicines that blocks dopamine, so they only felt about 6% had a good, good improvement. Benzodiazepines, they felt only about 8% had a good improvement. Lithium comes up as a little bit of a unique medicine. Another, again, I consider fairly potent medicine from a side effect standpoint, but they had a few people, just six people that tried lithium, and, but some of them did. I guess one of them felt that they were doing better. So another one out of New York, okay, 1988, so these are all pretty old. Uh, and they, this was a, a big paper of all dystonia. So it lumped, it lumped blepharospasm in with other like cervical dystonia and so forth, but they did an analysis just on the blepharospasm. And again, you see you have, you have less than 100 patients here total. A little more encouraging, and again, this just depends where you draw the line on good response, but in their, in their population, a little over half of the patients uh, were thought to have a good response with anticholinergic medications, okay, the ones that dry the mouth. 
uh, a little less than a third on baclofen, and maybe one out of five on clonazepam, which is one of those GABAergic medications. So these, again, just patients that reported reasonably good results. Uh, Joe Jankovic here, 1983, 1983, Joe, long time ago. Uh, 100 patients looking at uh, various dystonias, okay? And some of these, again, many of these also had mixed dystonia, so it was blepharospasm and cranial dystonia, uh, that sort of thing. Um, results, I think, a little bit similar. So triaxophenidol, again, this anticholinergic, tending to be the best. Uh, more than a third of patients uh, reported nice benefit for this. Tetrabenazine, one of the ones that blocks the release of dopamine, about one out of four reported a good benefit. Lithium. Uh, again, one out of four, levodopa, and then the benzodiazepines, the clonazepam again, maybe one out of 10 people uh, felt that they had a nice result. So again, these results aren't, you know, they're not knocking your socks off, okay, as far as benefit, but in any one person, you never, you never know. Last cut, I think the last one, uh, David Marsden, who, again, 1983, another very famous uh, movement disorder expert. Uh, this is in London. Uh, maybe he was a little bit more depressed or a little more pessimistic. His number is not quite as good. Very few people, you know, only three out of 25 felt to have uh, improvement on anticholinergics. Uh, and then phenothiazines are, are these ones that block dopamine, so a few of those. But again, you know, this, is, this one's pretty dismal looking uh, as far as benefit of these medications. Okay, so oral medications, you know, they, I, I don't think anyone feels they're the, the, the best treatment for blepharospasm. There's no doubt, of, you know, I don't think you could argue that. There's never been a proper study comparing an oral medicine to, to surgery or botulinum toxin. But again, in some people, they may have uh, some role, especially if you may have other conditions that might also respond to these medications as well. So the last couple of slides, I didn't see this elsewhere in the, uh, in, in, the pres in the program here. So just a couple of slides on non other non-pharmacologic treatments. So as we saw in the video, uh, when that woman talked, her blood flow spasm stopped. Uh, and there are, you know, these just antagonists, okay, these things that can make dystonia stop. Uh, in like neck dystonia, it's classically touching your, your chin. In blood flow spasm, it's usually talking. But there are some other people with, you know, that, that can do other things to, to stop the dystonia too. And it's always something to make sure that's been explored, something so easy and so cheap uh, to, as a treatment as well. There's a number of mechanical type things and non-pharmacologic treatments. I think most of the audience is going to be pretty familiar with some of the glasses, uh, biofeedback, hypnosis. You know, these things to relax people are, are potential treatments for, for blood first spasm and other dystonias. I mean, more adrenaline makes more, uh, as a rule of thumb, makes more involuntary movements. So these are some of the tinted, these FL41 rose glasses. And then you have the lid crutches here, which push, push the... Uh, the lids up, and these are again non-pharmacologic, but other potential treatments for blood flow spasm as well. So, in conclusion, um, you know, blood flow spasm may require a multimodal approach. We have patients that take injections and or our medications, and maybe have eyelid crutches. Uh, I think the medications. Maybe overall, one out of four people will have a pretty meaningful improvement with the medicines. That's not great, but sometimes they're fairly easy things to try. <coughs> There's very little data here to go on, you know, as far as proper clinical trials. And some of these non-pharmacologic strategies may, you know, certainly can be useful as well. All right. Thank you. And I think, yeah, we have a questions at the end with the roundtable. Okay.